That's good. If you have your Bibles, and I hope you have, turn to the book of Hebrews, chapter number 11. Hebrews. Hebrews, chapter number 11. Hebrews, one of the most controversial books in the Bible, stands right next to the book of Revelation in its controversy. Who wrote it? Who's it written to? Things of that nature. But the 11th chapter of the book of Hebrews is plain as it can be. It's pretty simple. It has to do with faith. It has to do with those people that are picked out by the writer, the author of Hebrews, to illustrate or point out certain aspects of their faith. The Bible said, without faith it's impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he's a reward of them that diligently seek him. So faith's important, folks. It's very important. Sometimes your faith is strong, sometimes it's weak. Sometimes it wavers, and sometimes it's fixed. And so we read in Hebrews chapter number 11 and verse number 1, now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. For by it the elders obtained a good report. Now he gives an illustration of it in verse 3. For by faith or through faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God. So the things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. Amen. Father bless this holy word. Amen. God give me unction to preach it in thy righteous name. Amen. Amen. The Bible says plainly here that there are things that cannot be seen, yet they are all powerful. Scripture says, looking not to things which are seen, but to things which are not seen. For the things which are not seen are eternal. And the things that you see here this morning with your eyes are temporal. They're here today and they're gone tomorrow. God is an invisible being, an invisible being that can make himself known in a thousand different ways in a thousand different times in a thousand different places, in any way he chooses. He can make himself known to you when you least expect it. And then when he does, you'll understand. In Hebrews chapter number 11, it said it's the substance of things hoped for. The writer uses a big word, it's eupostasis, and I want to give you this because it's important. In the book of uh, Hebrews chapter number uh, one, he says plainly, he is the exact image of his person, the word person, hypostasis. What is that? The translators of the Bible, the King James, use the word person because it has to do with the very essence of God. The Lord Jesus Christ is the image of the essence of God. So what does that mean? That means he's God. That's what it means. He's that. And so why doesn't he get into the essence of God? Because nobody knows the essence of God. He's a spirit being. As you've heard me say time and time and time again, you do not know the essence of a spirit. But we do know that God is spirit and we do know that you have the spirit of life in you right now. Whether you know the Lord or not, the breath that you're breathing, the heart that is beating, the life that you enjoy came from God and it will go back to God when you leave this world. But if you've been born again, you not only have life from God, you have the life of God. And that's a vast difference because that doesn't go back to God that gave it. You go back to God who gave you. Amen. To be born of the Spirit of God. So he starts off and says faith is the substance. In other words, the essence of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. It's the conviction that you have because you know, you know that the human mind is incapable of handling everything that God Almighty is able to do. Artificial intelligence, folks, is making quantum leaps right now. And a lot of people don't realize how quickly this thing is moving. I watched a woman in South Korea yesterday with some glasses on and her little girl had passed away and yet she was running up to her mother and her mother was looking at her little girl alive, running before her. The only thing was she couldn't touch her body because there was no body there, yet there was a presence there because of artificial intelligence. One of the, bright, one of the, one of the richest men in the world has just said that it can be a very dangerous thing. Folks, you live on the cusp of things changing so quickly that we can't even imagine. But think about it. The reason I mention this is simple reason. If man is able to do that, what do you think Almighty God can do? Amen. 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 
Amen. Don't judge God by your understanding. Don't judge him by your experience. Don't judge him by your ability to comprehend or see. Take what God says in his word. Things that are seen were not made by things that do appear. So we read in the Bible, it says the elders obtained a good report. Now I like to point this out, not because I'm an enemy of Solomon, but I want you to look at the 11th chapter of the book of Hebrews. Hunt long and hard and you'll not find his name mentioned one time. What happened to Solomon? That's between him and Almighty God. But God Almighty is very careful about who he elevates to be a hero before you. He's not mentioned in Hebrews 11. He's not mentioned as a champion of faith. Although we understand things about Solomon, he will learn from the Old Testament. Use them and God blesses us through them. Keep in mind, there is one God, there is one judge, and it's the Almighty that sits between the cherubim. And that's the one who determines whether you go into this book or not. So Solomon is in the hands of the Lord now, folks. That's where he is, just like all of us will be. But the Bible does mention this. It says in verse number three, through faith we understand the worlds were framed by the word of God. The word worlds here is ion. Ion, what does that mean? It's an age. It's a period of time. The ages were designed by the word of God. In plain words, you're living in a time that spanned 2,000 years called the age of grace. I just watched a photograph yesterday of Tutankhamun. Did you realize 1922 when they went into his tomb, it was a pristine tomb? It had never been opened by the grave robbers. They found it exactly as it had set for 3,500 years. They looked upon the face of an Egyptian king, my friend. That's a long time ago. That's not the age of grace. 3,500 years ago puts him almost contemporary with Moses. Moses wrote the first five books of the Bible and he lived 1,400 years before Christ. So King Tut is not far from Moses, a contemporary of Moses. Time has passed. A lot has gone on before we ever showed up. And the Bible says that God has designed every one of these ages down through the ages. The scripture talks about the dispensation of the fullness of times when God shall gather together all into Christ. What is that time? We don't know how long it lasts. It's going to be thousands of years long. But you're living in the age of grace that has lasted 2,000 years from the time of Christ when he said, I'll send you the Holy Ghost and he'll guide you into all truth. And we're here today and I'm glad that I'm not living to touch a mountain where it would smite me dead. I'm glad that we come to a mountain that is Mount Zion that is the grace of God. I'm glad, thank God, my friend, that I don't have to worry about making the wrong step and dropping dead in my tracks. He's a gracious, long-suffering God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, for by it the elders obtained a good report. We understand these ages then. They've been created, they're living, they're running their time. They'll finish their time exactly as that almighty absolute being says they will. And he does as he pleases. So the Bible says in verse number three, they were framed, created by this almighty being. If you take the 11th chapter of the book of Hebrews and all the people mentioned in here, and superimpose it over any period of time that man has been on this earth. For example, right now, take everything that happens in the 11th chapter of Hebrews and take it and superimpose it. What do you mean by that, preacher? I mean by that, that you can find a counterpart to Moses. You can find a counterpart to Abel. You can find a counterpart to Noah. You can find a counterpart to Enoch. You can find a counterpart to Abraham and Sarah. Not exactly like them, but the elements that made them what they are. You'll find that in every age. So look at your heart today. As you go through the scripture, check your soul out. Where are you in this thing? My friend, I can find myself in Jacob. No problem whatsoever. Amen. <laughs> I, I'm, his, I'm his bosom buddy. Yes, sir. The usurper. Oh, yeah. But I can also see just a little of Abraham in me too. For there has been times that I've been able to reach up above what I can see and take hold of that eternal one. Glory to God. That's able to do something above and beyond all that I ask or think. Are you listening? Sarah, some of you ladies in here today, you can tell Sarah, you, you, you have some of Sarah in you. When first mentioned about the birth of Isaac, you know what she did? 
why she came out and praised God and said, thank the Lord that he's going to use me to bring this promise of Genesis 3. Some of you are shaking your head. No, that's because you know the Bible, don't you? What did she say when she heard this in her tent? The Bible said she laughed within her soul. She laughed deep inside. Who is this man? Who, who are these three? What is going on here? And she made fun of it. And then God confronted her and said, you laughed. She said, no, I didn't laugh. No, I didn't laugh. Yes, you did. <laughs> yes, you did. Oh, yeah. And at this time of the year, you're going to bring forth a son. And she did. And Abraham, when he was told that he was going to have a son, a hundred years old, he did the same thing. He laughed in his heart. He laughed. And, and Abraham said this, Oh, that Ishmael might live before thee. Ask of God's what that name means. I ask you for a son. Here's Ishmael. Surely this is the answer. No. No, 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 no. Ishmael came the wrong way. He came through Hagar. No, that's not going to work. He's going to have to come where I intervene and I do a miracle and it's got to be my hand all over it. And so Sarah will revive. I'm a hundred years old, Abraham. Making a difference. I'll revive you too, son. And he bore a son exactly as God said he would. And then he said, is anything too hard for the Lord? That's a good one. We ought to memorize that scripture. And say, I can't find an out in my circumstance. I don't know what to do. I'm at my wit's end. That's good. That's a good place to be. For God meets you at your extremities. He meets you when you can't do anymore. Some of you can't get anything from God because you won't let him do it. You keep intervening and intervening and intervening and changing this and changing that. Sometimes it pays us just to get on our knees, shut the lights out, and say, Lord God, I've messed it up. Now what? And he'll take his hand and begin to move it and do something for you. So we have, we have the Almighty superimposed. How many of you, if I said this to you this morning, how many of you have Abel, a little Abel in you? What's Abel? He knew the right sacrifice. He knew a blood sacrifice was necessary. Cain brought the work of the fruit of the ground, what he'd done with his hands. I'm sure he was proud of it, but God wanted blood because only blood can cover sin. Only the shedding of blood. The coats that God made for them had to be something from a living being. And it had to be blood that was shed. So how many of you know that today? If you know that, you know a whole lot more than religion does. For religion teaches you how to be good and keep the commandments and, and, and your righteousness. And you build your righteousness and, and your relationship with each other is based upon how good you are. You become one of the good boy club. All this and all that. But the truth of the matter is, we are none righteous. No, not one. And all of our righteousness is as filthy rags in the sight of God. And when the Lord Jesus Christ came 2,000 years ago, he lived a sinless, perfect life. Folks, this is important. I know you've heard me say it before, but I'm going to say it again. He lived a sinless, perfect life and created a righteousness that did not exist until he lived that life. And then that righteousness of that sinless, perfect man entered into the very presence of God. And when he stu stu stood up in the pres came, came to the presence of God, God looked at him and said, sit down, son, right here at my right hand. Now, don't you angels and cherubim and seraphim, this is God sitting next to me. <laughs> God calls his son God. That's what it says in the Bible. God called his son God. And so the next time a Jehovah's Witness bangs on your door telling you that he's a creator. I got a thing from him the other day. By the way, I've got it in the kitchen. I'm going to keep it for a while. Usually when I get that stuff, I just lay it down, file it away, and put it in file 13. But this one I kept. This one I kept, and I looked at it, and I thought, well, let's look and see what they're saying. A lot of things they said were good, and they were true, and they could appeal to the human heart. But do you know one thing they left out? There was one name that was not even on that paper. I hunted and hunted and hunted. I found Jehovah here, Jehovah there, Jehovah, Jehovah, Jehovah. But the name of Jesus was nowhere to be found. That's sad. That's sad. That's sad. Do you know what the name Jesus means? It means Jehovah saves. That's right. It means he saves. You mean the Lord Jesus is Jehovah? He said in the book of John before Abraham was, I am. And I am is the one that spoke to Moses back there. When Moses asked him, said, who am I going to tell him sent me? You tell him I am hath sent you. We don't need, we hit not the Jehovah Jireh, Jehovah Sitkanu, Jehovah Shalom, Jehovah Rapha and all of that. That's all fine. That's a Jehovistic covenant combination. But no. You tell them I am hath sent you. Yeah. And the Lord yeah. Jesus Christ in the gospel of John identifies him as 
I himself has, I am, that I am, that I am, that I am. And John says that when they came to get him that night in Gethsemane, he said, whom seek ye? And he told them, he said, I am. And in italics, it says he. Italics is where the King James translators added it for continuity, but it's not in the original text. In plainer words, it is ego I me. It is an emphatic I am. Am. And you know what John says happened? They fell backward and hit the ground. That's what John said. In plainer words, even in the incarnation, bless his righteous name, in the incarnation of the Son of God, when he was standing before them as a man, they couldn't handle it. When he said, I am, that smote them on the... Now, what do you think is going to happen when you see the glorified Son of God? Who is the great I am? I am that I am. <laughs> and plainly, here's what that means. I exist because I exist. What do you need to exist? Nothing. I existed forever, eternally, before anything existed. That is an eternal being. Some folks make a little difference between eternal and everlasting, and I understand it. Eternal means no beginning, no ending. Everlasting means something that could start today and never have an ending. Yep. See the difference? There's a little nuance there. But eternal is from everlasting to everlasting. And the Lord Jesus Christ is from everlasting to everlasting. Yes. I hadn't really planned on getting on that, but I love him. Amen. <laughs> Amen, folks. Forget me. I'm nothing. It's about the Lord Jesus Christ. So you do that, you superimpose, you find Abel, you find Cain. We've all got a little Cain in us. I've got some diatrophies in me. Are you kidding, preacher? I've got a little bit of all of it in me. I've got Herod in me. Oh, yeah, I've got a little Judas Iscariot in me. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. Well, I can't believe that, preacher. Well, let me, let me just be honest with you. So have you. <laughs> Amen. 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 Do you understand that demons and evil spirits are blood brothers? Do you realize if you've got one, if you've got one of the spirits, you might as well have them all because that one spirit can go bring seven back worse than it? That's where you are today. Either you have the Holy Spirit of God who gives you victory over the flesh or your, per, or you, or you, or you, or your life is literally, life, your life is animated by a wicked, evil spirit. So Abel taught us a lesson. Cain taught us a lesson. Enoch, the Bible said, walked with God for 300 years. Yeah. He did what his great, 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 great grandfather could not do. You remember Adam? He walked with God in the cool of the day, but didn't last long, did he? Well, Enoch walked with him for 300 years. Now, I want to tell you something, folks. I've been here a while. I've enjoyed a lot of the things that life has to offer. But if there is nothing on this earth that is greater than walking in fellowship with God, nothing, nothing. And do you know what happened? It says in the book of Jude that he, God translated him. He took him and this was his testimony because he pleased God. He took him. So what do you mean? He not only walked with God, God came to him one day and said, Enoch, I want to let you walk with me on a higher plane than you've ever walked before. Come on, son, walk on high. And he walked with him. Now Enoch becomes a type of the church. Yes, he does, because he was translated that he shouldn't see death. In other words, he was taken from one place to another place. That's what translate the Bible means. Take it from Greek into English, Hebrew into English, whatever, to take it from one place into another place. Can't you imagine, Enoch? God walked with him, fellowshiped with him. They probably had the same conversation they'd always had. I remember when I was taking flight lessons. I'll never forget this. <laughs> My flight instructor would go up with me. I'd never go up by myself. I had better sense. <laughs> And he'd go with me. And then one day I got in the airplane and we went up and we flew around and we came back down and the flight instructor started getting out. I said, where are you going? <laughs> he said, you can fly today. That was the day after all of those lessons that I could fly solo. Anybody that's ever flown an airplane, that's a big deal to fly solo. And I sat behind that uh, yoke and I looked out in front of me and I thought to myself, now I'm either the biggest fool that ever lived or he thinks I can fly this thing. And folks, listen to me. I mean, you, you don't, this, you're not driving a car. You get up there at 5,000 feet and don't know what you're doing, you're, you're a goner. And he said, it's time for you to step up and go on. 
And so I did. And I enjoyed it greatly. And one of these days, he's going to say to me, just like he's going to say to you, step up now. It's time to move to a higher plane. It's time to go somewhere higher than where you've been. Are you walking with him? You know what it means to walk with him, to have fellowship with him. If we have fellowship one with another, the blood of Jesus Christ, God's son, cleanses from all sin. He wants fellowship with you. There's so much garbage preached from the pulpit today. I mean junk. You got angels and cherubim and seraphim and all of these, and they have their place. They've got their purpose in existence, every one of them. But not a one of them was made to have fellowship with God, but you were. You were. You were. What is man thou art mindful of him? He was made a little lower than the angels. But one day he'll be above the angels. He'll even judge them. He made something in you that is different from everything. He said you're in the image of God. He didn't say that about an angel. He didn't say that about a cherubim. He didn't say that about a, about a seraphim or anything. But you, made in the image of God. Have you ever had a burning desire in your soul to get closer to God? Have you ever had a, have you ever had a real desire in your soul to raise your head up above religion? We got our junk just like all the rest of them. I'll be honest with you. You're a Methodist. Well, I'm Baptist and you got your junk and I got my junk. <laughs> we all do. We all got a bunch of man-made garbage. Say, I never heard a Baptist preacher. Tom, I'm telling you the truth. That's what the Baptist Hay Boy Club won't have me in for, for that reason right there. But I'm telling you the truth. Okay? We all have our man-made stuff. And it's not necessarily, necessarily so bad. But it's just that that's just the way men are. We do things like that. But fellowship, he'll fellowship with a Methodist or a Presbyterian or a Baptist or a Lutheran just as quickly as he'll fellowship with, uh, with, with you sitting in this congregation this morning. Now here, here it is, Diotrephes. Listen to me, Diotrephes. Are you listening? You say, well, there ain't no way in the world God fellowship with a Methodist. Not good night, man. I mean, what are you talking about here? Well, you all messed up. And so you look down your nose and you begin to judge and you get all worked up and all and you get, you get, so, you get so full of yourself and so, so mad and so angry that people can just feel it, feel it running off of you when you get around them. They can feel that spirit coming out of you. And that's a horrible thing. Amen. And it's contagious. You ever notice how contagious it is? Here's why you do that, Diotrephes, because you're not in fellowship. And when you see somebody in joy... Somebody really with the joy of the Lord. Here's what you say. Ain't no way that's real. That's all put on. That's fake. <laughs> Have you ever had the joy of the Lord? There's nothing like it. And, if you, and, and here's the thing. If you're walking with God, you're going to have joy of the Lord. You're going to have the joy of the Lord. I'm glad for that, aren't you? Amen. Well, I've preached about Abraham. I've preached about Sarah. I preached about, I haven't preached much about Isaac this morning, but you know who Isaac was, don't you? He was the one who said, he said, here's the wood and the fire. Where's the sacrifice? And Abraham said, God will provide. And he did. Then you have Jacob, you know, the usurper, the one I told you that I, I'm a lot like Jacob. Oh, if I can see myself in Jacob, you wouldn't believe. But the last thing Jacob did, he became a prophet. And he started laying hands on his sons and he prophesied and every prophecy he made came true. If you read that Bible, exactly like Jacob said it would happen. Then you've got Joseph treated the way he was. I mean, his brethren sold him out. They hated him. And this was a family affair. Joseph, it's, ta it's horrible because Joseph's character was one of the greatest in all that Bible. He forgave those who sold him into slavery. He loved his brethren. And Joseph is the type of Christ. But you see, here's the problem with Joseph. It was a family affair. A family affair. How's your family going? Do you talk to your brothers? Do you talk to your sisters? How about your children? How about your grandchildren? How about your mother? How about your father? I heard one time about a preacher who wouldn't talk to his mother. I thought to myself, son, what in the world's the matter with you? She went through nine months hauling you around. And then she went on over here in the, in, 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 in the hospital somewhere and she went through no telling how long to bring you into this world. And you can't talk to her? Well, I'm too spiritual for that. Yeah, I know you're spiritual. That's the problem with the church today. Why not try some of these spirits? Won't you do that? Tell that mother you love her. Tell that daddy you love him. 
Tell that son you love him. Tell that daughter you love him. Tell that husband you love her. Him. Tell that wife you love her. Tell them you love them. Show them you love them. Your family relationship can be one of the greatest things on this earth. Satan will destroy you if he can destroy your family. Yes, he will. Your siblings. There ought to be love in that family. I heard a preacher say one time, y'all raise your head up, I'll tell you when to pray. <laughs> You ought to love your wife. You ought to love your husband. Well, if you knew my wife or you knew my husband, you wouldn't love them. Let me tell you something. Love is something you choose to do. And it may be the reason that you don't love your wife is because your wife has never really had anybody to love her. And she's not even sure she can trust you. Do you hear that? Or a husband, same thing. He's not sure. He's been stabbed in the back so many times he doesn't know. But the truth of the matter is, once you ever love somebody the way they ought to be loved in the Bible, it'll put something in them that can't be put in there any other way. And it can pull you together and heal problems. It can do things. When you pastor a church, folks, I go to funerals and I go to weddings. I've been to a bunch of them. I've been to funerals where they wouldn't even talk to each other. I mean, it was so thick you couldn't, you could cut it, the tension tension in the family because that's the only time they came together was to bury a daddy or a mother or something like that. Don't be like that. God's blessed me with a good family. Perfect family? No, I can tell you all their problems. <laughs> Give me a while. Write them all down. They got all kinds of problems, but I love them. I love my wife. I love my daughter. I love my granddaughter, mid oldest granddaughter, my middle granddaughter, my youngest granddaughter, and my great grandson. I love my family. I love them and they know I love them and that's the last thing I want them to know before I leave this world is that that I love them and they understand that and that's something that they'll never forget they'll never forget how many of you have ever had somebody tell you they loved you all right how many of you have never had anybody say they loved you now I don't have to raise your hand we're not here to you know embarrass anybody but you've never had somebody tell you they loved you. Isn't that sad? Now, I believe there's some people in here like that. Joseph loved his brethren. You know what he did when he saw them? You know what happened? He was, he, there was a ruse going on for a while. But then Joseph couldn't do it any longer. What did he do? He left them. And he went off into a room and he wept. He got all tore up. Because he loved them. That's right. He didn't have any reason to love them. They treated him like a dog and sold him into slavery. They wanted to kill him. And only because one of his brothers intervened that he was alive. And yet he still loved them. Of course, that's a picture of Christ in Israel. The Lord Jesus is going to come back and he's going to face his brethren. They're going to meet him. They're going to see him. They're going to, they're going to give an account, but all that. But here's, here's the bottom line. Have they wronged you? Has somebody stabbed you in the back? Somebody cut your throat? Somebody, somebody running you down now? Get in there and get a hold of God and say, Lord, give me the grace I need to forgive them. Let's get through this thing. I want to grow and I want to go. I want to walk in fellowship with you. And this is sucking the very life out of my soul. And I've got to get through it. I heard a man tell me, I read a man the other day, his email, and he sent it in. He said, Preacher, he said, the church that I went to, he said, well, he didn't take it. I'll take that back. He said, the church I'm going to, he says, the pastor is so bitter. He's so bitter. He said, he said it just literally, he said it just, just comes out of the pulpit. He's so bitter. And he said, preacher, I understand a lot of it. The way he's been treated, some of the things in his wife, what they've done to her and his family. He, he said, but he's let it literally destroy him. And he said, that's why I'm listening to you, preacher. He said, I love my pastor, but that bitterness has eaten me all up. And he says, I have to go somewhere else to get something for my soul. And so pastors do that. They deal with bitterness. Some of them blow their brains out. Some of them hang themselves. Right here in this town, I know of a pastor that hung himself. Right here in this town, I know of a pastor blew his brains out. Right here in this town, I know of another pastor blew his brains out. I know of another pastor went up, the, went up to the door of the church and took a gun, shot himself to death right there on the, on, the, on the door of the church. I've seen it time and time and time and time again. So what do you do, preacher? What do you do? What do you do? Get on your knees and say, Lord Jesus, I can't handle this. I can't carry this load. This is too much. 
I can't handle it. It's eating me alive. That's what it takes to be a pastor. That's what it takes to be a leader. Does anybody criticize your leadership? If you lead, they will. They'll pick you to death. What do you do? If you cannot lead unless you are bolstered and bragged upon and lifted up, you're no leader. A leader is like Moses who said to the Lord Jesus Christ when they had sinned against him a terrible, he said, this is a terrible sin. And then uh, uh, sinned against God. And he said, this is a terrible sin. So Moses went before the Lord. Moses, what he said in that Bible stands mountains above most of what you read that anybody else ever said. What did he say? What did he say to God? He said, you got a book. You got names in that book. He said, let me tell you something right now, Lord. He said, if you don't forgive these people for what they've done, take my name out of your book. That's a leader. That's a leader. You get that? That's above us. That's greater than us. That's a leader. We need leadership at Temple. We need leadership at Temple Baptist Church. We need somebody that can take a lick, get on their face, get a hold of God, let him, let him heal them and restore them and get back up and get back in front of the people and let the people see that though they're human just like you, that there's something special about them that God's given them where they can get the job done that they're called to do. Think about this. We're called sheep. All of us, right? And I'm a sheep too. But think about this. It is... It, completely goes against nature, completely against nature, to reach into the flock and pull a sheep out and make that sheep the leader of the other sheep. Think about that. And that's what he's done with me and every other pastor. He has taken me out of that which is natural and puts me in a position of leadership. And so therefore I have to lead and I need the grace of God to do it and I need your prayers to do it. Amen. And I hope you'll support me. Yes. And I hope you'll pray for me because I'm not perfect. If somebody comes up to you and says, well, you listen to you, that preacher there at Temple Baptist Church, don't you know he's got problems? I got plenty of them. I can write a book if you want to read it. God Almighty is a good God. Amen. How about you? How about you? How many of you sitting there in, the, in, those pew, in, this, in these pews this morning listening to me? How many of you think for one minute that you deserve to be in this house this morning? How many of you think that you earned the forgiveness that God gave you because you've been good? God forgives me because I'm good. No, he does not forgive you because you're good. How does he forgive you? He forgives you because of what Christ did for you. Everything you have with God is based upon the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. Every bit of it. Every bit of it. And I'm going, to, I'm going to close with this one here this morning. And that's Rahab. Some of the uh, more sophisticated brethren like to call her an innkeeper. You know, they want to help God out. Poor old God, he doesn't have enough sense to know she's a prostitute. I say that reverently. <laughs> Rahab, folks, ran a bordello. Okay. She was a prostitute, but she was a smart prostitute. She listened to the truth. She believed the God of the Israelis, the God of Israel, was the true and living God. She had heard about the Red Sea opening up. She'd heard about that. She'd heard about all that he'd done to these kings where they'd come through the land. And she knew that that was the true and living God. And then God just so happened to send spies and they came to the house of Rahab. Isn't that strange? Just like Ruth just so happened to fall, you know, to know Naomi and then come back into the, into the Holy Land and she went into the fields of Boaz. You know, these coincidental, there's nothing coincidental. If you put your lot in with the Lord today, he'll start opening doors for you that cannot be opened any other way. So what happened to Rahab? I'll tell you what happened to Rahab. She wound up in the genealogy of Christ. Matthew chapter number one. She was a believer. And she gave up her bordello. When she came to her faith in the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, it from then on, she was a different Rahab. And I say this for the Rahabs that are out there right now. 
You don't know who's watching this. You have no idea. There's no way in the world you can know. But there may be somebody sitting there right now that you're a prostitute. And you're selling your body on the streets. And you've probably sold your body to some of the pastors. There was one pastor here in Knoxville so stupid. I mean, you talk about stupidity. He hired a prostitute. Now we're talking about a pastor. He hired a prostitute and paid her with a check. <laughs> now that's as dumb as it gets. There was one high official in the Catholic Church that came from Kansas City, Missouri. About 35, 40 years ago, he came in here and he hired a prostitute and he wound up getting killed. It happens. Ask the police. They'll tell you that there are many many church people, um, uh, pastors and so forth that are out here doing so. So if you're a prostitute, I know it. I know what goes on. I understand that. They're liars, they're fakes, they're phonies. But Christ died for you. Amen. And he put Rahab in that Bible just for you. Rahab is in there for you to know. You don't know what I've done, preacher, to make a difference what you've done. You know how long I've been in this, making a difference how long you've been in this. Listen to me. There's forgiveness for you at the cross. There's forgiveness. Rahab is in there for a reason. And that reason is for you. Are you a prostitute? Then you have forgiveness through Christ. You can be delivered from that. Are you a drug addict? You can be delivered from that. Are you a pimp? Are you selling? You can be delivered from that. What are you doing? It makes no difference what it is. He tasted death for every man. Now, here's, here's what's wrong with cultural Christianity. Here in East Tennessee, we got people that go to church, been raised in church all their lives, and, and their, faith is, is, is about as, their faith is about as deep as that. About that deep. Okay? It's all put on. It's fake. It's phony. It's phony as it can be. And I know that. But there are people sitting in this place this morning that have been raised up out of the pits of hell. You know what it is to be forgiven. You know when God got a hold of you and brought you up out of it. And I want people that are watching to know that. We got phonies and fakes in here. Yes, sir. But we've got real in here too. Yes, we do. And I beg you in the name of Jesus, ask him to save you. Ask him to cleanse you. And he'll do it. He'll do it. Whether you, I don't think if you're red, you're yellow, you're black, you're white, it makes no difference. The ground at the foot of the cross is as level as it can be. Amen. Just ask him today. He'll cleanse you. Father, I pray for that one that's watching. That one that's watching right now. I know this reaches out and I know they're watching because I've read what they say. Let some soul this morning reach up like Rahab did, a prostitute, and take hold of your hand. And Father, cleanse them and let them sense that cleansing and lifting of that burden and realize that a new and wonderful life has started in Jesus' name. For Jesus' sake, I pray. Amen, amen, amen. Glory to God, amen. Let's raise, sing. what are we doing here, brother? What, Page what 384 you got? in the All-American Church. Whatever you got.